podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Sustainable Buildings Canada webinar on uh, deep energy retrofits, uh, the thermal bridging guide. Uh, my name is Adam Jones with Sustainable Buildings Canada. Um, I am here to introduce the, the webinar today and um, help everyone um, manage the process. So I'm going to start by explaining a little bit about um, how to control the, the system uh, to ask questions. You'll notice um, on the GoToMeeting applet, you'll have a, a hand that you can raise. You can click on that to raise your hand. If you do that, what we'll do is put you in the queue to ask a question as soon as the break um, comes. And if you have a question that you do not want to ask uh, personally, you can type it into the, the question panel and I'll read it out to the, the presenters uh, once we get to the question and answer period. Um, let me just give a, a quick overview of what we're going to do today. Um, so here I am, Adam Jones. I'm welcoming you and introducing you uh, to the webinar. I'm just going to go through a, a little brief introduction before I hand it over to our presenters, Andrea Piatella and Kathleen Norbone of RDH. Um, first, what is the? I, I want to introduce the, the purpose of this. Sustainable Buildings Canada um, was created based on these two numbers. The 12% of Canada's GHG emissions are directly attributed to buildings. These are sort of scope one emissions. Um, the vast majority of this is for energy use in buildings. Um, and then another 5% of our uh, national emissions are attributed to electricity generation for buildings. Now, Sustainable Buildings Canada has spent a lot of time over the last uh, seven years, since 2015, um, commissioning papers and research on how to address this problem. How can we drive down energy consumption in buildings? How can we make the buildings that we are designing and operating and living in and working in more energy efficient and environmentally sustainable? Um, we have a lot of resources and we've developed a, a, lot, a library of resources on how to do this for new buildings, how to um, use different novel technologies and combine them together to get the best, most high efficiency, environmentally sustainable building possible in the particular situation that that building is going to be. Now, one thing that we've noticed in the last few years is that there's been a huge focus on new buildings, but that we have millions and millions of square meters of existing floor space in Canada um, that was built many years ago and is um, as yet um, not energy efficient. Some of it has been retrofitted, but a huge amount of those buildings are ripe for or um, addressing with new technologies. Um, there are, according to NRCAN, uh, 117,000 buildings that were built before 1990, which represents 250 million square meters of floor space. There are 55,000 buildings that were built before 1960, 75 million square meters of floor space. So these are buildings that, unless we do something about them, they will continue emitting the same amount of emissions from energy use as they have been for their entire lifespan. However, if we look closely at those, which we have started doing, we see that there are actually many ways to address this problem. So we have um, been commissioning over the last two years or so, um, specific research on how to address existing buildings. Um, so from different angles, how to change the mechanical system, update it to air source heat pumps, um, how to use just um, energy management systems uh, to reduce energy consumption. Um, through analysis and building building automation. Um, also, how to how to take sort of bigger projects like the Toronto Community Housing Corporation, how to take a portfolio of buildings, look at how those buildings use energy and how to um, reduce that energy across a, a full portfolio. This is the next step in this this process is um, specifically looking at how. Thermal bridging affects existing buildings and how to analyze this for deep energy retrofits. Now, this study was completed by our presenters today. Who, there they are, Andrea Piatella and Kathleen Norbone. Um, and it's focusing specifically on um, how to interpret thermal bridging in this, uh, the um, Savings by Design program, which is what we operate. 
but a lot of the things that they um, learned in this research can be more broadly applied to thermal bridging energy modeling for existing buildings. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our, our presenters and what we're gonna do is I, I'm gonna hand it off to them um, and they're gonna lead us through an overview of um, thermal bridging in existing buildings, what it means, how to understand it, how to model it, um, and then they're gonna go very in depth um, into um, the, the tool that they have uh, built um, for energy modelers for the um, Savings by Design program. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Kathleen. There you go, Kathleen. Adam, thanks for, for, for making it sound like we're doing so much and we're gonna fit it into one short hour <laughs> or really 45 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that intro, Adam. This is great. Um, so, sorry, I just need to organize my screen so that I can see what's going on here. Dreaded, there we go. Okay, you guys can all see this, right? Can do. Okay. So, uh, as Adam mentioned, this is our Deep Energy Retrofit Thermal Bridging Guide that Andrea and I put together. Um, I think we'll just get to it. Uh, Here's our <laughs> disclaimer page. RDH disclaimer. <laughs> uh, so uh, just a quick uh, agenda. We will talk about thermal bridging at a high level, uh, just kind of give an overview of, of what we talked about in our guide. We will talk more specifically about thermal bridging in existing buildings. There will be a mini break where you will have time to ask questions. Uh, we will also let you know that in the next section, sections four and five, we will be doing a deeper dive into the meat of our of our guide, and more specifically, how to apply it and um, an example spreadsheet. Sorry, just got sidetracked. So I'm going to start off with what is thermal bridging at a high level. The technical definition of thermal bridging is localized areas of increased heat flow through walls, roofs, and other insulated building enclosure components caused by interruptions in thermal insulation. So to simplify that, it, what I'm saying is we heat our buildings, buildings lose heat through all of the surfaces, uh, and then where there are interruptions in insulation, we, so we want to keep our insulation, we want to keep our heat in, so we insulate our buildings. Where there are interruptions in this insulation is where thermal bridges occur. And in this little schematic detail here, we have insulation represented by these pink bars. You can see that the floor slab is bisecting those insulation, that insulation, therefore, more heat can be lost through that floor slab, and that itself is a thermal bridge. These two details are also represented in the thermal images, where the yellowish orange color indicates a higher temperature, which means heat flow. And so in these locations, heat is actually flowing out of the building and we are losing it. When we talk about building perform performance, the basics are we refer to the in to assembly performance as a U value, which is the rate that heat flows through an assembly. The inverse of the U value is the R value, which indicates the thermal resistance of that heat flow. We more com we are probably all more commonly familiar with R value when referring to performance of enclosures. A higher R value, uh, which indicates, as I mentioned, a higher thermal resistance, also indicates a lower U value and less heat transfer. This is a good thing. So just want to reiterate the, the connection between R value and U value. So we, we will be talking about U values. But <laughs> R value is the most common term used to describe thermal performance of building systems and materials you will probably have heard like an R40 roof, an R20 wall, but what do we actually mean by these descriptions? 
there are various ways to describe the R value, and this depends on which parts of the assembly are actually included in our definition and what extent of formal bridging we're actually accounting for. Uh, but this, we really, really want to point out that communication can really get lost in these definitions. And we're going to go through some definitions that we've put together that how we refer to our values of assemblies. But it is really important. If I can make one point, the, the biggest point is to make sure you're all on the same page and you're talking about our values in the same way. So to iterate that point, uh, I have these four definitions of R values here. The nominal R value is the rated R value of the installation itself in its installed condition. And if you look to the example assembly on the right, it is just this green bar here, nominal R value. The assembly R value is that nominal R value plus all of the other layers of the assembly, which includes surface resistance films. Uh, in this example assembly, you can see the yellow spans from the brick to the concrete. The clear wall R value is the that assembly R value, so all of your layers, plus the two-dimensional effect of standard repetitive thermal bridging. So this means uh, if our backup wall is a stud frame building, then we have the thermal bridging effects of those studs need to be accounted for. Uh, specifically to this example, we have the repetitive effects of these brick ties that are uh, also, in, also thermal bridges. And lastly, the whole wall R value, which includes all of that that I just mentioned, of the, assemb of the clear wall R value, sorry, plus the thermal bridging at changes in planes or interfaces. So what I mean by that is where a wall meets a roof or a wall meets a window, these transitions likely have um, breaks in the insulation or differing R values, which then indicate thermal bridges in those locations. To further extrapolate on all of these definitions and to, well, to explain these definitions, I want to use that, this example assembly and break it down a little bit more. So the nominal R value of the insulation, if we're assuming that this example assembly has four inches of say mineral wool insulation at an R rating of R4 per inch, then we have an approximate nominal R value of R16. The rated, or the assembly R value, sorry, which will include in this case, surface film resistances, your backup wall, um, the air vapor barrier, plus your insulation itself, add all those up together is approximately R19. So you can see how adding more elements of the wall assembly will increase your assembly R value. When we're talking about clear wall R value in this example, we're also adding the brick ties and any sort of insulation fasteners that are required to fasten the insulation back to the backup wall. And when we incorporate those thermal bridges, you will see that our R value has dropped because we have thermal bridging, we're losing heat through those thermal bridges uh, and we end up with something around an R17, R value. When looking at the whole wall R value, we're taking that clear wall and then we are assigning thermal bridges specifically to this wall assembly. So even though these thermal bridges occur, say at a roof parapet where it hits the wall and the roof, we need to account for it somewhere. We don't need to account for it in both because we would be double counting, but we do need to account for it somewhere. And so in this case, I've said, okay, we're gonna account for the window perimeter here and a roof parapet and the wall where it hits grade. And when I include all of those thermal bridges into this calculation, I get an R value of approximately R11. So you can really start to see where thermal bridging really derates the thermal performance of the wall when we start including more and more thermal bridging calculations. 
I do want to point out that I'm talking about the same wall. This is the same wall. Nothing's changed. It will perform the same as it's built on site, but I'm just describing it in different ways. So it, it is really, really important to make sure when you say, I need a clear wall, R value of this, that the person you're talking to also agrees that it includes all of these things. So I described how we talk about the performance of wall assemblies, how we talk about the performance of thermal bridges is measured in transmittance values. So we have linear and point thermal bridges. Linear, point, linear thermal bridges also have a linear transmittance value, which is also known as a psi value. The thermal transmittance of a linear thermal bridge has, is, is per unit length of that thermal bridge. So for example, an intermediate floor junction, as you can see in that thermal image, balconies, window to wall transitions, um, as I mentioned before, parapets, these are all linear thermal bridges because they occur, they occur over a length. Point transmittance are also known as chi values, and these occur at, or these are for a single point of the thermal bridge. And when you actually do that calculation of the heat loss associated with that thermal bridge, it has a length attributed to it already. So an example of this would be a structural column or beam that pr protrude through the building enclosure, as you can see in the detail, or sorry, in the thermal image on the right, the column is penetrating the soffit. And so that point thermal bridge already has a heat loss associated with that entire area. So it's only one point that we're looking at. Um, roof anchors are another example. Uh, balcony guards are another one if you have like glass guards or metal guards. I'm going to hand it over to Andrea here. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so the next few slides really are kind of a high-level commentary that builds off what Adam mentioned and Kathleen has mentioned already, um, leading into, you know, uh, thermal bridging in existing buildings. And I'm just going to point out that a lot of the, the detailed commentary in this will be occurring in the second half of the presentation, where we'll really deep dive into the guide and talk through kind of uh, our approach and, and you know, specifics on, on this. But, you know, kind of just to, to wrap up some of the points already made, um, you know, the introduction that Kathleen just went to applies to both existing and existing buildings and new construction buildings. They happen in all buildings. You know, we have junctions, we have interfaces, it's everywhere. Um, you know, for for the most part, it's typically identified using drawings. Um, and, you know, in new construction buildings, you kind of go through, work on the work through the drawings with the architect and determine while the th thermal bridging is occurring. Uh, with existing buildings, you know, what are the state of the existing building drawings? An example shown here of something that's fairly illegible. Do they even exist? Do we have access to them? Um, and that can make some of that uh, interpreting and understanding of thermal bridging in existing buildings a little bit more challenging. And so that this kind of preamble here really is just, um, you know, uh, uh, touching on the importance or the, the value of kind of what we did as part of the guide to try and help and bridge that gap between what's available to make these assumptions and to kind of determine the thermal bridging and, uh, you know, what kind of assumptions that we have to make when, when doing those calculations. So really, um, you know, at a high level, and, and I think Adam really touched on it well at the beginning, uh, we've kind of listed here thermal bridging and existing buildings and some of the reasons why we think they're important. We've listed four things. There's like a ton more, and I'm sure you can think of many of them, but really here kind of it's talking about why we want to, why we think they're important and why we want to make sure we understand them and, and are incorporating them as we deep dive more into energy modeling of existing buildings if we're not already doing so. Uh, and so the, the first one here would be understanding the heat loss. You know, if we know we have an old, you know, 1970s uh, MERB with this, you can see those like, you know, pretty slab edge lines, like, 
you know, your windows are single pane, aluminum frame, they've been there since the beginning. Like, what is that low hanging fruit that's ripe for retrofit action? What can I go in? I do a heat loss calc. I, I look at my thermal bridging. I understand where it's all happening. And I'm like, well, these windows are up for retrofit anyways. You know, let's go in and do that. Let's work on those things. So it really helps to understand the actual performance or the actual heat loss in the building. Uh, the other piece here would be benchmarking and calibration. If we don't uh, really understand the actual performance of the windows and walls, we're not really going to get, you know, especially in, in terms of uh, those of us on this call who are energy modelers, we're not going to develop an energy model that demonstrates or, or matches the actual performance of the building because that building, no matter how you refer to the or reference the R values, if you're talking about nominal or whole wall, the bills are just going to tell you how it's actually performing and it's going to have all that thermal bridging there and it's it's going to be super real with you and you want to make sure that when you benchmark and do calibration you're really kind of understanding how that as best you can what's actually happening uh, the third item here would be you know a little bit less tech well a little bit less kind of numerical and technical and and more just kind of you know logistics and implementation just kind of condensation indoor air quality comfort you know i think we can all agree condensation is bad you have a cold, uh, something cold, cold surface on the inside of your building, condensation builds up, which can lead to mold growth, poor indoor air quality, um, you know, drafty or uncomfortable walls and windows that you're sitting next to. So really this is just kind of outside of the numbers, outside of the utility bills, you know, these pieces are also really, really important with existing buildings and they are directly attributed to you know, thermal bridging. And um, the last one on here kind of ties in some of these, and we've already touched on it a bit, would be understanding the building performance. And I think Adam really touched on that at the beginning, that we know climate change, well, I'm going to say this, we know climate change is a real thing. Um, and thermal bridging is one piece of, of understanding and addressing uh, the energy performance in existing buildings. And, you know, as we work to, to on these deep retrofits, as we work to understand thermal bridging and, and kind of, um, integrate all these pieces together that can lead to higher performance enclosure, which can lead to the utilization of heat pumps, which can reduce energy consumption in these buildings. So these are kind of some of the reasons why this scales up at a bigger level and why we think this is really important. So just a little context here, uh, Kathleen and I both work as energy and sustainability analysts at RDH, you know, so my plug on the fact that scaling back a bit further, you know, this is uh, a study that was done in 2011 on Toronto's future weather. Uh, this is summer. This includes summer um, hot days and rainfall and temperatures. I think some of us can agree that in some ways the future is now. Uh, in the last year, if we look at the West Coast, I know this is Toronto, but the heat dome, rainfall, flooding, like we see this all the time and we're constantly bombarded with news articles about these things. Um, and all this plays into kind of you know, we need to be thinking about all this action right now. And so that, that kind of ties into this idea of what happens, not if, but when the government mandates energy retrofits in existing buildings. Um, and we've kind of put together a, a list. It's not comprehensive by any means, but it just covers different jurisdictions with different goals and different timing. And the reason I just want to talk about this here is that scales the thoughts, you know, I know we're talking about thermal bridging and bridging in existing buildings, but that's one piece of the puzzle towards getting towards these net zero carbon uh, and energy reduction and carbon reduction goals for the building stock. I, uh, you know, it's not just new construction, it's also existing buildings, but I think exist existing buildings have a long way to go and kind of understanding, capturing, incorporating and focusing on thermal bridging and existing buildings is such a huge step towards that. Um, so you know, this is just my, my little plug on making, you know, why this is important. I think it really aligns with Adam's commentary earlier for uh, why Sustainable Buildings Canada is involved in this and why you know we, we wanted to work with them to develop this guide. I think the next slide is our mini break in questions. Um, so Adam, I'll let you jump in if there's anything. I just wanted to, to kind of point out that we are deep diving into the guide next. Uh, so, you know, uh, we will we'll showcase some more of those pieces then, but if there's any questions right now. So we have uh, just uh, one question that has come in already. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to click on that raise hand button um, and then we can open up your mic so you can ask um, directly. Um, just one clarifying question um, from Kyle is effective R value the same as clear wall R value? So that is something that you need to determine with whomever we're talking to about this. 
we have used effective R value in place of Clearfield R value, but maybe not everyone understands it that way. Some people might understand effective R value as your whole wall R value, or just like your your assembly R value. So um, our definition, we haven't used effective R value at all. We've only used those four definitions that I went through. Um, if but if you want to define effective R value as something as a clear field or a clear yeah clear field R value, then I think you would just need to let whoever know you're talking to that that's what you're talking about. And just to jump in there quickly, I, I think commonly that that yes that would be the case, but really to Kathleen's point, like I think we're consistently you know there's that language thing of just making sure no matter what word you're using, you're still talking about the same thing. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Okay, so we have a couple more questions coming in. While I wait for more questions, I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to ask the audience a question. We have some polls set up, um, and I'm going to send out a question for everyone else to answer. Uh, so first, though, uh, as a re response from that, uh, so should we drop uh, using the term effective or value? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like it's one of those things personally that I I don't think I think you know if if as an industry we find effective to be clear, uh you know then that, it's fine to use it right you know we just kind of this is more of like our in house approach to and language on this and and we find this to be the way that that we've described it and you know apologies if that was confusing, um but I think that uh more so that the focus should be on you know, that whole wall versus clear field or effective, like that should be, you know, very clearly understood because whether or not you've incorporated all your thermal bridging or kind of, I think more so to what we've been previously doing is, you know, when we talk about that effective, we we're not saying all of the installs, we're not saying the junctions for thermal bridging, we're, we're not, or maybe in some cases we might be right so it's just, I think really it's making sure we understand what the difference is between the whole wall, which includes pretty much as much thermal bridging as we're, we're intending to capture versus you know just that repeated thermal bridging that we've been I think more so using for for the, for the you know the known past okay to that to this point that it, it might be a little bit different depending on where you are in the in the building industry and sort of what your approach is what you're looking at um, there is a poll up on your screen now there should be a poll up on your screen um, asking you what your role or your involvement in the building industry is. Um, please feel free to answer that. Um, and while we do that, we have another question here. Um, is there hold on, is there a good method to significantly reduce thermal bridging on the window frames without replacement um, for apartment buildings that have significant exterior surface area that is composed of large windows with aluminum frames? So. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Did was that clear? Yeah, I think they want they want to know um, some strategies for for improving thermal bridging at the windows um, without, without replacement. Without replacement. I was going to say that's the key without, part. There, yeah. So without replacement. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some kind of like first step options that we always try to recommend. Um, that and that just kind of goes with like weather stripping uh you can replace the sealant around it and this kind of stuff will only really prevent drafts per se like it, it will improve the performance a little bit ultimately the performance of your windows depends on a few things uh your frame material uh, also the installation, but it depends on the glass itself, the insulated glazing use it, unit, if there is one. Um, if it's single pane, you're really not getting much out of that window. Um, so if you're looking at it from like a homeowner perspective, the smaller things you can do, I would definitely recommend weather stripping and, and resealing, caulking around the perimeter. Um, on a larger scale where maybe you have more opportunity to to improve your windows, you can look at something like over insulation. This will go probably hand in hand with 
redoing or adding some exterior wall insulation, excuse me, insulation. And what I mean by over insulation is when you add exterior wall insulation, you're also adding insulation on top of the window frames themselves. And that will improve the performance at those locations. Um, but you, we'll get into that a little bit more and I can talk more specifically about the window install detail and, and what we've included for thermal bridging. Um, but ultimately it is the detail of the install itself that is going to improve your performance and the actual window. So when you replace your windows, you're just getting that much better performance. Um, and then also with the installation, you can change its position within the wall and that will improve it, in its performance as well if, if you line it where we recommend you line it. <laughs> um, it yeah, there's, there's some that can be done, not a whole lot. Thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to share the results for this question, and then I, we've got another question here. So there, you should be able to see there, um, our audience today is uh, predominantly engineers, um, it, followed by energy modelers, designers, and building owners and managers, uh, with some construction and builders um, making up the balance there. Um, okay, so another question here, um, when... R values, okay, so this is, there's actually a couple on this. Um, when R values for wall assemblies are calculated, the performance claims by the manufacturers are, are, are the performance claims from manufacturers taken at face value. Um, and are these thermal resistant uh, variations taken into account? Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, that's something that the manufacturer will stipulate. It, it, they'll tell you what they are measuring. Um, if you look at Rockwell, for, for example, their spec sheets will say rated R 4.2 per inch or whatever per inch. And that will be like the insulation alone. Um, if it's a proprietary system, it'll be, they'll tell you, it'll be like any from the stud, like an uninsulated backup wall to whatever, the edge of the vapor barrier. Um, and it'll tell you what it they're actually including. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that if there's any more to add to that. Uh, the only other thing I would say is in some cases, there may be an experience that we know that over time, the insulation may degrade um, with temperature or with insulation. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're looking, especially with an existing building and you have like older, you know, Older constructions, and I, I think some of that may come in as as part of the tweaking. And um, you know, if you're doing an energy model and you're trying to calibrate, there is some tweaking that you can do in terms of like trying to assess where where the where it's at and, and kind of giving it giving it some thought. So I would say like, uh, you know, using the the um, the kind of known values or what the um, manufacturer is, is saying is is good, but also just the idea of being kind of uh, giving it some thought and giving it thought to the condition um, and whether or not there is any like known degradation over time of the R value with, you know, in, in respect to cold temperatures and then trying to apply some sort of conservative approach to capturing that. Okay, that's, um, we have, okay, I'm going to ask one more question and then I think um, okay. we'll, we'll have to move on to the next section just for time purposes. Um, hopefully we can ask Kathleen and Andrea to hang around a little bit longer, maybe at the end of um, the presentation, uh, the next section um, for any further questions, because there are some detailed questions being asked. Um, so first we're going to, sure. I'm going to ask the audience again, one more question. And meanwhile, um, for Kathleen and Andrea, the question is um, the, is there, oh there, what is the status of an existing building retrofit code? Like, oh. um, sorry, go ahead, Andrea. Oh, no. Um, okay. So, because I think we've listed it in that chart there that says like, you know, Pan-Canadian Framework for Clean Growth and Climate Change Existing Energy Code by 2022, which is not happening. Um, my, uh, not, not that I had an inside scoop at all, but I, you know, some of the people that we work with are involved in, in committees and kind of, uh, you know, conversations about, about these things. Uh, I, I, you know, I feel like it's coming. I feel like all of the things that we talked about, um, uh, make, make sense that it's coming. I personally am not involved in the development of anything. I would honestly 
guesstimate and you know do not hold me to any of these numbers but more so not 2022 but 2025 um but you know that's that's just kind of my my sense right now on on the the implementation of that but i like i said i'm i'm at licking my thumb and holding it in the air as a guesstimate there so. <laughs> okay thanks um kathleen anything to add no i think andrea got that one <laughs> okay good all right uh this blow i'm going to close this poll now um and then we can see the results um so you can see uh, with sort of a, a third a third of participants today are not planning uh, building retrofit, um, and then uh, the the balance are. So it looks like uh, we've got quite a few people who are you know looking at uh, this is practical information they need right now. So with that in mind, um, now's a good time to move forward with the the rest of the presentation. Thank you all for your questions, and if you have more questions, keep putting them in, and then we'll try to address as many as we can um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, thanks. Sounds good. Okay, so to get to our deep energy retrofit thermal bridging analysis guide, uh, we saw at a high level thermal bridging, we, we know how to define it and wall assemblies, and we can look at it more in terms of the performance of the whole building. This kind of is covers the first section of our guide in a little bit more detail. You can spend some time reading through it for sure. Uh, I'm not gonna touch any more on that. I'm gonna go into the next two sections which talk more specifically about thermal bridging in existing buildings. And then at the end, how, we've, how we recommend how to include it in energy modeling. So thermal bridges, as we saw, can significantly impact a building's thermal performance by contributing to large amounts of heat loss. We need to account for that heat loss in, thermal, in our energy modeling because, as Andrea mentioned, we wanna be able to understand what, where the low-hanging fruit is for retrofit opportunities. We want to understand what our mechanical loads are so we can size our equipment properly we also want to understand what the performance of our building is at a whole because we want to understand how our how much we're improving when we make these adjustments we do these retrofits and what that means for incentive programs like savings by design like how much more are we going to improve than the baseline we also saw that existing buildings are especially difficult to assess thermal bridges because you saw the copy of that drawing. That's a real drawing that we got that we have no idea what it actually says. So if even if you have drawings, can you, can you read them? Can you understand what's going on? Um, and then in addition, if, if you wanted to look on site, the building's already built, their thermal bridges are right there, but you can't actually see them because you have cladding, you have finishes, you're not gonna put a bunch of holes in your wall just to figure out what's going on. So what we've come up with is one solution specifically for savings by design program uh, that tries to simplify this exercise of, of guessing what the thermal bridges are and what their associated performance level is. which brings us to the Deep Energy Retrofit Thermal Bridging Guide. How we came up with that list is we looked at past Savings by Design projects, we looked at our future work, and we tried to come up with a building typology that we thought we would most commonly see in this program. What we came up with is a 1970s high-rise multi-unit residential building, probably of mass construction, so either concrete or brick, and including features like balconies, aluminum frame punch windows or window wall, um, probably some insulation at the roof, maybe some at the exterior walls, whether interior, probably not exterior insulation. Um, we'll probably have uninsulated slab on grade and below grade structure if like say there's a parking garage below grade. So when we look at that building typology, we came up with nine thermal bridges that we thought would be common to this type of building that we are going to use moving forward in this deep energy retrofit thermal bridging guide. 
the nine thermal bridges that we identified are listed here. And I'm just going to go through, I'll go, I'll touch on them a little bit more uh, coming up. But for what we did with those thermal bridges is we categorized them into um, performance levels based on uh, the details. So we looked at published literature to determine what a appropriate psi value would be for those thermal bridges. Uh, we used the Building Envelope Thermal Bridging Guide from BC Hydro and Merson Hirschfield. Uh, we looked at the um, ISO 14683, which is a list of thermal bridges for buildings. It is the Thermal Bridges in Building Construction. That's the name of it. Uh, another one, that, another uh, published source that we looked at is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Development of Thermal Bridging Factors for Use in Energy Models. So this one in particular had a lot of existing buildings, a, a lot of details of existing buildings of mass construction. So that's maybe why you might not have heard of that one and why we used it. So we took we looked at those published sources. We gathered all of the information on thermal bridges and psi values for the details that we selected. And then we categorized them into these performance levels. So for example, I took the parapet detail, which is included in our list. And at the sort of lower performance end, we have an unmitigated thermal bridge. And we have a, a psi value of 0.8 associated with that. And what that unmitigated thermal bridge looks like is maybe we have some interior wall insulation denoted by the pink bars again, and some maybe some exterior roof insulation. But when you look at it, there is a large area for heat to be lost through that roof slab to the exterior. And so there's not really much being done to prevent that heat loss from happening. When we look at a sort of mid-range performance level, we're looking at what we call we called a mitigated thermal bridge. And this is, for example, we've added some exterior insulation, some additional roof insulation, and or some insulation on the parapet upturn on the towards the interior side. And what that does for the thermal bridge is it makes the path of heat loss longer. And so it improves it makes it harder to lose heat and therefore loses less heat and so that is reflected in a lower psi value of 0.4 watts per meter kelvin down here at the higher end of the performance range we have prevented uh, thermal bridges which does not mean to say that they're eliminated by any stretch of the imagination it just means that we've done a little bit more work to prevent that heat loss from happening. So in this case, you can see that we've completely wrapped the parapet in insulation. There will still be heat loss because we have the imbalance of heated interior to cold exterior in winter. Um, so we're, we're still going to get that heat loss, but it is mitigated as much as possible in this case. We've also uh, kept that additional exterior roof insulation to to mitigate it further. And that again is reflected in an even lower psi value of, of 0.3 watts per meter Kelvin. So this is all uh, information that is presented in section two of our of our guide. It goes in again into a little bit more detail so you can read that for sure, which will set up for the next section which is the table, our table of thermal bridges, which is the cata catalog of what, of the main bulk of the work that we've done. We have, there's this in the next two pages. So over three pages, we have the nine details listed. Um, you can see their sort of generic name on the left. Uh, in the bars, the colored bars across the top of each line, we have the associated thermal bridge in both imperial and metric values. These are the values that we've collected from all the sources and we sort of 
took an average and thought came up with what we thought was appropriate for for that detail. Uh, and then we have the three performance levels grouped by color. So we have gray is the unmitigated, where we're assuming your thermal your detail will be in its existing state. There may be some cases where your detail might have some amount of mitigation depending on the the uh, history of the building. Um, but we are most we are probably going to be referring to this unmitigated category of thermal bridges when we're talking about existing buildings. And then the light green is the mitigated section and then the darker green is the prevented section. Uh, within each thermal bridge type row, we have, the, and within the performance level categories, we have schematic details of what we expect those details to look like or what we anticipate those details to look like. So in, again, to go back to the parapet, you can see the same details that I showed on the previous slides. We have a little bit of a description of what we would like, what we would expect those details to, to have. In this case, as I mentioned, some interior wall insulation, some exterior roof insulation, and then an uninsulated parapet. And then as you move across the performance levels, you will see the added mitigating strategies uh, it, within each detail and then a little description. So one thing I want to point out with the parapet and in some of the other thermal bridges we have multiple options for the prevented performance level and this is because we think you can mitigate the thermal bridge in a variety of ways and what we've represented specifically for the parapet because I was just talking about it. We've also included an option where there's a The third section of our guide really goes into how we envision all of this coming together and how you can actually apply it for, for your buildings. What we did was we looked at the building envelope thermal bridging guide and they have a set of steps that are an example of how to use their guide. So what we did was take their guide, take their steps and we just adapted it for specifically for existing buildings for the Savings by Design program. The Building Envelope Thermal Bridging Guide is really 
meant for new construction buildings. And as we saw, it is really a kind of a different beast. You're doing the same things, but you need to have, have particular attention paid to different things because of the existing conditions. So I'm just gonna go through this really briefly. And then I'll, we've also included in this a, an example spreadsheet that we put together to demonstrate how, how we calculated it. So I'll just touch on that shortly after this. So step one of the of how to do your thermal model, the thermal bridging calculations is to, is to determine how to divide up the building. So the building envelope thermal bridging guide gives you a few different options of how they you can categorize your building. What we've recommended is using a by your wall assemblies from your floor assemblies and and your roof assemblies and even your different wall assemblies if they have different r values or performance levels and then you want to uh separate them because they will they will perform differently step two is to determine the clear field assemblies so within each of those construction types you need to determine what that clear field is and as a reminder the clear field takes into consideration all of the layers of the assembly plus the repetitive thermal bridging but not the thermal bridging at the interfaces that's what the spreadsheet is going to do for us so with existing buildings you might not have drawings to tell you what those r values are you'll probably know that in in new construction drawings right now you will find that it'll have an assembly laid out for you it'll have an associated r value you take that and you plug it into your model and that that's kind of it but for existing buildings you might have to do a little bit more digging uh, the subject matter expert might be able to inform you or point you in the right direction um, you can try to use the building envelope thermal bridging guide. Uh, I like to use ASHRAE 90.1 if if I really don't know what's going on. Um, they have a lot of kind of generic assemblies and um, if you haven't used it, associated U values and R values. And I, there's enough um, variation that I feel like it covers a lot. We've also made some recommendations for how to handle windows and spandrels up here. So I would, I would definitely read that. Step three is determining your linear and point details. These are your thermal bridges, and this is where we want you to look at our guide and what we put together. We gave you all of the thermal bridges that we expect you would be using, and we gave you the associated psi values for them. So what we think is beneficial at this step is to look at that guide, say, what thermal bridges are included in my building, and what is the probable performance level of those thermal bridges, select those and just plunk them down right into your calculations. Um, the hour list of thermal bridges might not have all of them, but you do, you should consult your subject matter expert if there are any more that would apply to your building. This is a, a great oh, wow. moment for me to jump in and say we are running short on time, but okay. um, if you could stay around to walk through the, the tool itself, that would be great. And I would like to uh, acknowledge um, everyone that I forgot to mention this earlier, but if you go in the your little go to meeting control panel, there's a, there should be a little section that says handouts and the PDF of the guide is available right there. So you can click on that, download it right now. Um, while Kathleen is walking through this. I'm sorry I didn't mention this yep. earlier. Um, no, no, that's fine. Okay, back to you. Thanks. So just a couple more steps. Um, step four, you have to determine the length and area of all of those takeoffs. So you need to get the area of your walls, the lengths of all your, all your thermal bridges, and or count if it's a point thermal bridge. And uh, those will all get input into the spreadsheet that I'll show you in steps five, six, and seven, and that's where all the calculation happens as well. So just to pivot real quick, this is the spreadsheet that we're using. Uh, it does come from BC Hydro for the Building Envelope Thermal Bridging Guide. So if you are using that guide, 
you may have seen this before. What we've just done is, is taken an example building, we've done our calculations and we input it into the spreadsheet right here. So this is more a representation or an example of, of a calculation that we've done. Uh, if you do want to stick around, I can show you maybe a little few tricks that I like about it. Um, but I don't think we we didn't make the spreadsheet, so I don't think it, it <laughs> warrants me walking through how to use it. I think that's a, a fair point, Kathleen. Um, let, why don't we we informally close, and then if you want to point out the couple of things that are you know maybe a few tips. Um, I see we are losing a few people. That said, it's a very small percentage. It looks like there's a, a clear interest in seeing um, these sure. details. Um, so for anyone who has to leave, thank you so much for um, joining us in the, in the webinar today. Um, you will receive a follow-up email with a recording um, with a copy of the presentation and then uh, contact info uh, for both of our presenters and SBC and some links to all of the other research that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, so hopefully you, you'll get a lot out of this. You've already gotten a lot and um, there, there's still more available. So for anyone who has to leave, Goodbye, um, have a great day, and uh, for anyone who can stick around, um, we'll hand it back over to Kathleen to walk through a few of these uh, tips. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, I also am curious if maybe there's questions that haven't been answered, we can do that, or like I, whether you have questions or whether you wanna see the spreadsheet maybe is like, do you have another poll, Adam? Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't have a poll for that. Um, okay, we do have some more questions. Um, so if you want, I'll, I'll just pull a couple um, sure. here. Um, one, are there any engineering calculations available we can use in our proposals to show the impact of uh, bu the building retrofit on the net effect of future average annual temperatures in the city? So I, I think that's sort of like, not just the building itself, but if these were cumulatively applied, how would that affect um, urban heat? Yeah, is it, I'm guessing that's kind of like an overall, like if we took all of the thermal bridges from all the buildings and kind of added up all of the heat loss, like what what are we looking at sort of thing? That's how my, I'm interpreting that question. I don't know that there's anything that, like that. I haven't <laughs> seen that either. Okay. Uh, but if there is, or if it's not happening and is going to happen, we'd be super interested in reading about it or involved in it. <laughs> like, that sounds, I feel like that's a research proposal right there. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay, um, one more specific question about um, the, the uh, um, thermal bridging specific. What about bridges from concrete patio dividers? How would you treat those? Is So concrete patio, oh, dividers. So if you have like a balcony, that's shared sort of between two units and then you have a divider on the balcony is what I'm assuming that they're talking about. Um, so off the bat, I'm thinking your balconies are outside of your building. And so anything that you put on your balconies doesn't impact the thermal performance of the building, unless you went with a strategy where you wrapped insulation around your entire balcony to prevent heat from being lost out the balcony. And then you put a divider on top of it, that would penetrate that insulation, which would uh, lead to heat loss through those connections. Um, yep, so- I was oh, sorry, go ahead, know, Kathleen. I was just gonna like wrap that up and just say, probably not an issue. <laughs> well, the one thing I was thinking, um, to kind of build off of what you're saying there is if those are impacting how the bulk, like if they in some way are connected to the building at a horizontal capacity, any sort of connections that tie back to the building um, would be thermal bridges. Uh, the other thing too would be if it's increasing the structure of the balcony itself and then the actual structural connections back to the building, uh, those would be kind of increased there. So, you know, I, that, that I think would be like how that would you know, kind of impact, right. it would just really depend on the installation um, and where the penetrations are kind of going through to the building in whatever capacity they are. And then focusing on that from either kind of an exterior or interior, you know, condition. I mean, I, I think some of the yeah. things like with balconies is you can, you can do some insulation just under the step 
um, you know, where the balcony kind of connects with the building. Um, yeah, and that also depends the uh, amount of thermal bridging also depends where your installation is. So if your installation is non-existent, then <laughs> not really doing much, but if you're gonna retrofit it and you're gonna add exterior insulation, then you want to not connect your balconies through the exterior wall. If it's interior insulation, then it's not really affecting your building either because your insulation is continuous along the interior of the wall. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, I, I'll add one thing that um, we've seen is uh, for some deep energy retrofits of buildings with um, balconies, um, particularly older buildings, uh, we've seen uh, people cutting the balconies off entirely um, as a way to deal with this. Um, and, and, yep. and also, I would say that it's not only, they're not only addressing thermal bridging, there are other issues with balconies that some building owners don't want to deal with. Um, and I think that's possibly an approach to that as well. The other thing too would be to actually work to enclose the balconies into the building. Um, I, you know, and then kind of strategize as to like overcladding exterior to that and putting on glazing or whatever, making it almost like a solarium in some capacity or not like a fully glazed solarium. But uh, the only thing with that that we have seen come up is just understanding egress conditions. So making sure that the farthest place from the, you know, in an apartment building that the person can exit from, um, if you add a bit more, you know, interior condition floor area to the unit, does the, do the, all the egress conditions still apply if you're gonna enclose the balcony as part of the conditioned living space? That would be a great approach. Okay, I have um, another question here about uh, R values. So are there any differences between effective R values calculated as per ASHRAE 90.1 and the building envelope thermal bridging guidelines? So not this one, but the, um, the BC Hydro building envelope thermal bridging guide, right? That is how I'm understanding the question? Yeah. Uh, Andrea, do you know? Um, I don't think, I mean, I guess really in, in 90.1 Appendix A, uh, you'd have to read, there's a lot of great descriptions at the beginning of the sections that talk about them. I don't know if they include, I don't believe that they include any detailed thermal bridging. So the, my understanding, you know, there's a couple in there that are great where they have like, you know, a stud wall with insulation in the cavity and then there's a certain amount of exterior insulation um, for that one example. And we use that a lot because it's just a really great one to understand if you, you know, the conditions of a, the enclosure performance of, of a, just that specific wall type, which we've seen uh, pretty commonly. Um, I, though that that would be more in line with like effective right so the, it might not necessarily and you might kind of some of the things you can do is kind of take a look at it make does it make sense does the description make sense does it include all the pieces that i want um but i just don't believe that it includes that next step of having all of the whole wall r value thermal bridging conditions but like i said just you know kind of taking the time to read the description in ashray 90.1 appendix a would be my like you know, final yeah. final answer on that, but I, I just don't believe that it includes all of the detailed thermal bridging. I think it's more of that kind of clear field or as we were talking about earlier, effective. I mean, I, I don't even think it includes any sort of thermal bridging for um, cladding attachment systems or insulation fasteners on the exterior side. So it does account for studs and that's probably it because they are only really focusing on the two dimension heat flow through the assembly and not really the three dimension building at, at interfaces. Yep, yeah, no, I, I, would, I would agree with that. So kind of keeping, keeping apprised of what your exterior uh, cladding attachment system is can you know, significantly impact the performance of, of your insulation. Mm -hmm. Great answer. There, just a quick plug there for RDH, but there is a cladding <laughs> attachment guide online that is honestly really, we, I use it all the time for estimating um, cladding, the impact of cladding attachment on insulation. Mm -hmm. So you can check that out if you're interested. I will okay, maybe about. we'll share the link um, in the follow-up email. Um, all right, let's, sure. uh, there's one more question here. Uh, there's okay. a few questions that I'm just gonna answer in the chat, everyone. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then uh, we'll proceed with the, uh, the Sure. Um, so that question is, it's uh, regarding the, the balcony dividers, but I think it asks a, a bigger question, which is how do you decide which thermal bridging scenarios are impactful enough to include in your calculations? Ooh, <laughs> it's a good one. Um, so we've identified 
the probably the most impactful or what we like to distinguish as the most impactful thermal bridges there's probably i don't know tens of hundreds of more thermal bridges to be honest um but we didn't include so we can't include all of them it, it would just be too much <laughs> but uh it i think there's a kind of threshold, and um, I, I do I do work on a lot of passive house buildings. So there's a threshold that we have in passive house that it's like if your psi value is less than this, then um, it's not real. It's negligible. So there is a an actual math like a number associated with that. Um, the problem with just using that is that existing buildings are really far off from passive house performance and so the the types of thermal or the the quantities of thermal bridges that you're going to see in existing buildings is probably a lot higher so there's not really even like a cutoff point too but one way that you can figure out as a retrofit option is you can use this spreadsheet and then it tells you um in column k here what your uh, individual heat loss percentages for that thermal bridge and so if you input if you have all of your thermal bridges um, I know that we had said in the guide in the presentation that we want you to differentiate it by construction type but if you were doing sort of your own calculations not really for um, energy modeling then maybe you want to look at putting your entire building in one spreadsheet and that will give you all of the heat loss percentages for each area so you would have like right now i have a heat loss percentage of this wall area it's a, it's a really large area but it, it also contributes to 20 percent of my whole excuse me my whole building's heat loss um and like my my intermediate floors here is that's a really long length and so that is also contributing to a really large percentage of of heat flow and so you might be able to use something like this to prioritize what your what your upgrade options are and just to jump in there quickly i mean i think kathleen you kind of touched on it when you're talking about the long lengths like sometimes it's not intuitive sometimes i'll think something's gonna be really important and it's not or sometimes i think something's not gonna be that important and it is um i think there's a kind of a literacy that comes with doing more of these calculations and understanding where we think the important thermal bridges will be. But at the end of the day, if you have a lot of something and there's a side value included, it's probably going to be an impactful thermal bridge to consider. So if you have a lot of parapet, if you, I mean, and really, I think the ones that we've listed are pretty common for all buildings to include. Um, but if there's other pieces that you're kind of considering, maybe your building kind of zigzags in and out or has uh, different conditions that, you know, you know, in in some buildings might not be considered that impactful just kind of giving it a, a bit of a lens of how many places this occur uh it can just help just to kind of you know even take that first step of i'm just going to account for it and see where it lands yeah that's a good point the other thing is that as you do more as andrea mentioned you do more of this type of analysis and calculation then you'll start to recognize the things that impact thermal bridges uh, when you have concrete touching concrete and there's like a your whole wall thickness of it, that's a big thermal bridge. Um, if you are looking at your um, wall assembly, you have two different wall assemblies and say like this one has three inches of insulation and this one has six, that's technically still a thermal bridge, but it's going to be a lot less because um, you're still insulating continuously. Um, so yeah, to reiterate on all of that, the thermal bridges are actually where your heat loss changes. So uh, even on something that is completely insulated, then you'd still have a thermal bridge, technically. And that would certainly not be good. <laughs> no. I think that's a good transition though. Um, if, if people are still here, it looks like there's 71 people here. So I might as well just go through the uh spreadsheet a little bit more um if that's okay adam absolutely okay so as i mentioned we did not make up this spreadsheet this comes from the building envelope thermal bridging guide 
uh, you can find it on their website. We can include that link too if you want. Um, but what it does is it catalogs all of your Clearfield assemblies, all your Clearfield areas, all of your thermal bridges associated with those areas, and then it spits out an effective R value up here. So note that this is calling it an effective R value, uh, but when in actuality it is more closely related to our whole wall R value that we've that we've defined. Um, so I'm going to pick this sheet because I was kind of um, I mean not that one because I was kind of playing around with the other one. But what you have is the chart here of proposed building entries. So you can see I've I've broken out each of my construction type along the bottom here. I have three different above grade walls, one of them being a spandrel because it's something that we recommend you doing, taking your spandrel as an opaque wall and not as a window. Uh, and below grade wall, roof, all of my different constructions are along the bottom. Uh, in this table, proposed building entries, I've added in areas of my, of that wall assembly that is present on my building. So you can see here, I'm working in Imperial here, but you can change your units up at the top really quickly if you're more comfortable with SI. Um, you put in, all of the inputs occur in these green cells. They will um, originally be blue like this. You can see it here, and then you can add additional lines where needed. But for now, they're green, so I've input all of my entries here. I've used drawings, likely or lucky to have drawings for this one, so I use drawings to take do all my takeoffs. And then I input my uh, Clearfield wall assembly transmittance value here. Um, and then my source reference, I've noted that I, I assumed those uh, transmittance values based on an assembly closely matching uh, ASHRAE 90.1, this table. Um, you can add some notes over here to keep track of your of your um, inputs. And then in the next section, you have the linear interface details. So I've added in as part of my roof assembly, including parapets. And I have uh, like a main roof parapet. I have a podium as well. And then I also have some curbs that are supporting the mechanical equipment up on the roof. So I've added those in as thermal bridges as well. And then I did, again, the length takeoff with my drawings. I inputted my psi value here, and I've just made a note that I've taken that from the thermal bridging guide, from our thermal bridging guide. Uh, and then I also actually have some roof anchors up on my roof, so I've counted those as best as I could. Maybe I'm overestimating to be a little bit conservative. I have 53. I put that in here, and then I put in my my chi value associated with that. And that is also drawn from our thermal bridging guide. So the results of this spreadsheet are here in your overall opaque wall thermal performance values table. And we're looking at the proposed building. So this gives you your effective R value. As I mentioned, this is the whole wall R value that we're looking at right now. And then it also gives you the effective U value, which is the inverse. So if you did the math, then that would be the inverse. What I like about this spreadsheet and what's cool is that you can include or exclude whatever entries you want. So if I just want to look at my roof anchors, I uncheck it, and then I see that, oh, my effective R value went from 7.3 to 7.4. So they're actually affecting my building by 0.1 uh, R value. If I exclude, if I only want to look at my my clear field assembly, it should match this 0.114 if I take out all of my thermal bridges. So there you go, you get 0.114, which translates to 8.8. .8. That's my clear field R value. And then as soon as I start adding in thermal bridges, you can see that my R value starts dropping. I really like it. I think it's really handy. Um, as I kind of mentioned and touched on before, there's also column K here that gives you the total percent heat flow. Uh, column J gives you the, the heat flow in the actual units of measurement. 
um, and then it converts it to a percentage of heat flow over that entire construction or wall assembly. Um, so you can see that my main or the roof at my podium level is actually where I'm losing the most heat. And then my roof at the at level 20 is where I'm living, losing the next um, most amount of heat. Um, and then so this, as I was explaining earlier, is a great way to determine where you want to concentrate your efforts for a retrofit. So if you're losing like half of your heat through your podium roof, you really want to try and increase that. R value beef up that insulation to prevent that from happening. So another thing that you can do that I like about this is if you use this base building section, you can take your with everything included, you can take your um, U value, your your whole your effective whole wall U value, and you can put it in here, 0 0.136, and then this this probably decimal point rounding or something that is giving me and does not equal <laughs> um but you can put it in here and then start to play with your um with your say you want to increase insulation here just on the podium so you have a lower um u value now which more heat resistance less heat loss so now if I make it that whatever, however much insulation I'm adding there, that's will improve your building by 5.7%. Um, anyway, I, yeah, like I said, I, I think it's, it's handy and it's really easy to use. It's, it's an Excel spreadsheet. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with Excel. Um, and then what I've done at the bottom is I have, tabs for each one as I mentioned I also have an overall U value tab so what I did was took the the total area and the uh, the effective R value or the opaque U value as listed here and I just input those like total wall amount and the transmittance value from that sheet and then I input them into here to, for like an overall building um, R value. Some projects require that for certain things. And so you can see here my total effective R value of my whole building is 3.8. Still Thank 50 you. people here. Does anyone Does... have any questions about the spreadsheet? <laughs> Just, um, thank you for walking through uh, that. So my question for you is, is this, can we share this spreadsheet that you've put together um, so that people can see exactly how you got to where you got. Um, For yes. sure, yeah. Okay, great. The other thing too is that it's honestly in this form, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you can use the original, but you know, we've kind of set this up so that it makes it really easy, it, just easier. It's set up in a way that you can use this one, um, you know, keep this beta version that shows our calculations. Um, but then, you know, on a given project, just like zero up the numbers and the takeoffs, um, update those values and it's kind of set up on that kind of wall type construction type basis to make it really easy to use for future projects, especially um, in combination with the guide. Yeah, that's uh, brilliant. Brilliant work, um, Andrea and Kathleen. Thank you again. Um, I think we'll, uh, I guess we can give another minute for any questions, but it looks like uh, I think you answered everything, and if not, oh, cool. um, we have uh, we're going to we're going to share your contact information um, in the, the follow up email, um, so that we you can get all the questions. Perfect. Um, you'll have people asking you very specific questions about their buildings. Um, one other point that I have for everyone. Oh, we do have one other question. Um, oh, let me read it here. Sorry, uh, you have the percentage of total heat flow. So if we have, let's say I have completed an energy model, is it necessary to have the losses from the software through the envelope? The losses from the software so, being Paul, this spreadsheet. Um, let me see, Paul, if I can open up your mic, maybe you can ask that question directly. And I wonder if we're mic. talking about like an annual basis versus like a, you know, kind of more of a peak condition. Right. Let's check. Okay, there. 
Mike, I, or Paul, I have unmuted your microphone. If you'd like to ask the question directly now. Okay, sure, thank you. So um, my question is, how can I, how can I know if I do an ECM? So I have the baseline building model, let's say in Energy Plus or something, and they, uh, I got the breakdown for each of the components. So there is going to be one component for heating, one for cooling, one for ventilation. Maybe I can get the um, infiltration, yeah, all of that separated. So then how can I know what is going to be the associated energy consumption through the envelope? Because here, uh, the percentage of total heat flow is due to the walls, due to the windows, roof, um so yeah I, I am trying to understand how am i go i am going to compare between the baseline and the proposed building and then exactly how much savings i am going to get for the annual consumption so yeah i'm not sure i'm a little confused yeah. and i don't my question makes sense um i i'm just gonna jump in i i don't know if i fully understand but um this guide here and this spreadsheet is really designed to kind of um calculate what the performance values are that go into the energy model so you know from an energy you know this can be used for a variety of, of different things and from a variety of different people um but you know i'm an energy modeler kathleen's an energy modeler uh and uh you know we kind of use all these in tandem, right? So we would take these values um, and develop the, the you know, if we want to really capture an existing building, we would take, you know, we would build an W2, WT2 a wall construction in the model and use that kind of effective R value in K13 for the, the performance of that wall in the energy modeling program. Uh, you can actually add more tabs to this. So one of the things that could be done is you could add ECM tabs that kind of develop uh, the performance of specific walls, windows, or walls, roofs, et cetera, like in here, um, and then kind of implement those as your ECMs in your energy model really annually. That's just going to come out in terms of a parametric analysis or multiple energy model runs that you're getting. So there's kind of the annual impact of all of these things. It's going to come from Energy Plus or Equest or IES or whatever you're using. This tool really develops uh, the performance that gets used in the energy model. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah, sure. This is going to be helpful for the inputs okay. of the energy yes. model. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Paul, and thank you, Andrea, for uh, answering the question so clearly. Um, okay, I think that's all we're going to have to wrap. We've already taken an extra half hour of your time. Um, I will thank you again so much, Andrea and Kathleen, for A, developing this um, guide for us, and B, explaining it all in such great detail. Uh, we really appreciate your time and effort and expertise on this topic. Uh, so thank you again. and. Um, we will hopefully see you very soon at another Savings by Design workshop or on another project. Thank Thanks, you. everyone, for attending. Thanks, Adam, so much for, for hosting. My pleasure.